Hello, everyone. This is episode 228 of At Percussion Podcast. We are recording on April 9th, releasing on May 7th. My co-hosts today are Carly Vigna. Hey, everyone. Hey, Carly. Hey, Brian Nosny. Hi. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. How's this corona thing going for you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not all the answer I can give. Good. Yeah. Everyone's safe. That's what matters. Exactly. Exactly. True. Um, ben Charles. Hi, everybody. Uh, what's up, Ben? Whose uh, 100th birthday is it today? Yeah, so I just wanted to give a quick little mention on the podcast that to, uh, two days ago, actually, April 7th, was Ravi Shankar's 100th birthday. Ravi Shankar, of course, being the Indian music guru that worked with the Beatles, uh, in particular, worked quite a bit with George Harrison. Um, and I think it was, well, it was 2010. It was his 90th birthday. And I had tickets to go see Ravi Shankar in Chicago. And unfortunately, he fell ill before that performance and had to cancel the performance. And then he, of course, has passed away since. So I almost got to see him play live, but not quite. Um, but I did have a friend, I think, on that same tour that, that saw him play in Richmond, Virginia, that said, or maybe it was in D.C., I don't know. But she said it was just a mind-blowing performance. Um, and obviously, Ravi Shankar is a sister player, but he's worked with quite a few fantastic tabla players, in particular, Ala Raka. Um, and there's uh, George Harrison is right now, I think, promoting um, if you put on uh, social media your quote unquote inner light, which was a Beals tune that Ravi Shankar worked on. And uh, if you tag it, uh, the inner light, I think is the tag. You can look it up. Uh, they'll donate money to some charitable organization. But people are posting videos of them playing music, of them doing meditation, of them doing dance, all sorts of. Fun stuff. So yeah, definitely check that out to celebrate Ravi Shankar's 100th birthday. And if you'd like to listen to more Ravi Shankar, one of my favorite Ravi Shankar albums is his uh, album recorded with George Harrison. Emil Richards also appears on an album called The Chance of India. So that's my little two cents. That's lovely. I saw that his daughter, Anushka Shankar, um, yeah. she was supposed to have a celebration, right? And uh, yeah. all of that got canceled. But she's also a wonderful performer and writes beautiful music. So I definitely suggest that that be yeah. checked out too. Also, interestingly, uh, his other daughter is Nora Jones. Um, and she posted, she was supposed to be involved in that celebration. It's nice that the two of them get along. Um, but yeah, she posted a video of her playing and she was singing a song. Sorry, I think it's called Missing You or something like that. Very sweet tribute. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely. Um, and who do we have left? We have Casey Cangelosi. Hey, Casey. Hey, everybody. What's your historical uh, bite of the day? What's, what's yeah, up? sure. I just have a quick one. And it's uh, it's neat that it's Ravi Shankar's birthday because there's a string of significant composer birthdays. And let's see. Well, actually, I'll start with a premiere. 1824, Beethoven's Ninth was premiered today on release date, May 7th. And then just seven years after that. Oh, wait, can I do my math right? No, sorry. Um, that's uh, nine years after that, Brahms' Cut birthday. It out. <laughs> so we'll what? edit. Out. We'll edit out your math. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> and yeah, just right after that, in 1833, Brahms' birthday, and then seven years after that, in 1840, Tchaikovsky's birthday. So it's cool. And then after that, all the way 1961, Phil Campbell is born. You guys know who Phil Campbell is. Well, he's the guitarist for Motorhead, so. Ah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> failed, failed uh, rock history. Uh, I don't actually feel that bad about not knowing that. I know, that was the, kind of the joke, yeah. It's, like, <laughs> right. it's, you know, it's it's not totally related to Tchaikovsky and Beethoven, but it's not, like, totally unrelated either. Roll over <laughs> Beethoven, you know that song. <laughs> um, and we have another surprise co-host with us today. Uh, pigs fly, I guess, because we found Ian Rosenbaum to have a free hour. Hello, Ian. I have a lot of free hours right now. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back, and we're so happy to have you. Thanks for uh, being here to help us have a fantastic conversation. The guest of the hour is Andy Akiho, everybody, composer and performer of new music. His work was commissioned by the New York Philharmonic, National Symphony Orchestra, Shanghai Symphony, Oregon Symphony, American Composers Orchestra, so many. 
Akiho has been recognized with many prestigious awards and organizations, including the Rome Prize, Lili Boulanger Memorial Prize, Harvard University From Commission, and so, so, so many others. And you also may know Akiho uh, being an active steel pianist and um, just seeing him performing his compositions all around the world with a bunch of cool people just like Ian. So, Andy, thank you so much for being here. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? Uh, tell us, how are you doing with this corona thing? Um, it's a very strange time. I don't even, I mean, I just think it's a really uh, unique time right now. And um, I mean, for me, I'm just still writing like crazy. But um, it's, I mean, for me personally, I, the only difference is I'm not going to different coffee shops and different bars to write. I'm stuck at home doing it. Um, but I'm, I'm really sad that a lot of us aren't getting to perform and, and you know, uh, all my friends are performing, so it's, it's weird not to be in that community, you know, right now. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, I don't even know how to describe it. it I, I think I'll be able to reflect on it later, but right now it's just, I'm just still trying to get Ian's piece done. That's my number one priority right now. <laughs> uh, Ian, tell us about the yeah, I'm checking in. <laughs> okay. That's why Ian's here, he's uh, making sure I'm not... Yeah, this is all I'm doing outside of writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us about the piece. Ian, what did you commission? What is this? Actually, th this idea came from Andy. So so back in 2013, Andy wrote a, a, a quartet called Pillar 4 that I'm sure a lot of people watching have, have heard of. Um, and when, when he was writing that piece, he kept telling me that he had all of these other ideas. He, he had a lot of ideas, far more than could fit in uh, the 10 to 12 minute piece that he was writing at the time. Uh, and so he actually back then kind of sketched out the framework, the skeleton for what would be Seven Pillars, which is this piece for sandbox percussion that he's writing right now. In the end, this piece is going to be an evening length piece around 75 minutes Long, a really, really big project. It's going to encompass seven quartets. Pillar four is right at the middle of all of it, uh, plus four solo pieces, one solo for each person in sandbox. We've heard about that. Um, what was it? Uh, I, I know that Svet got the Glock part, right? That's and then Jihei got the vibes, right? You have the marimba. And it was yeah. Ayano playing multi? The, the bottles and the, the uh -huh. hanging pipe, like that whole setup. Oh, yeah. oh no, sorry, I, I meant, of course, Pillar 4, yes, but I was wondering for the solo parts, I thought that they were already assigned, wasn't it supposed to be like yeah. each, yeah? Can you tell us about that, Andy? Oh, yeah, that's exactly about right. I mean, um, I mean at the time, originally it was Gwen, on the vibraphone, and then um, he had it on the air, and they, they did an incredible job with the premiere and everything. And, you know, I was, that couldn't come to fruition back in 2012, 2013, because, um, you know, I was just supposed to write one piece, but I always had this dream of writing the full, the full call, you know, the very <laughs> Sorry. I always had the dream of writing uh, Henri. Hey, Kitty. Henri. Uh, um, the... <laughs> This cat's awesome. <laughs> like, no, I was writing the, the full 11 movement piece back then, and I was mm -hmm. thinking in my mind when Sandbox um, came to me to, to realize the whole thing, it's like, oh, this is perfect because it's, it's, it's been a dream project of mine for like seven years now. We've been talking about it forever, so it's, it's glad that, I'm glad that we're finally getting, getting to do it and, and that I can get this out of my system because it's been in there forever and I, I, mean, I, I want to share it you know and I, I love working with Sandbox and they're doing an incredible job with it you know they've already learned a hell out of it for and it's exciting to, to, to collaborate on all the other movements too um, yes yeah, it's, it's been a long long project but a lot of fun yeah. Well, Andy, as a sort of a follow-up question to that, it, it's funny, there are so many composer and performer relationships that, that are just like a match made in heaven. And to me, the very first one that comes up in mind is Bach and Gould. Glenn Gould's performance of J.S. Bach is just like, you know, mind-blowingly good. It's almost as if Bach was writing for Glenn Gould. 
And another very close association in a very different way, in a sense, is your association with Ian. It seems like it's been a very long running thing. Um, what is it about Ian's playing you feel that that compels you to write such great music for him in particular? And Ian, likewise, what is it about Andy's composition that propels you to want to keep playing it? I mean, it's... what's most like Glenn Gould about you? <laughs> so many Why things. Like cover bands. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who wants to go first, but yeah, either way. <laughs> well, I mean, it goes deeper than music for me. Like Ian's solid friends, like his brother, you know what I mean? So musically, music is just a way to communicate stuff like that you know it's like cool and hanging out sometimes you know like that's that's deep to me so i write for the players the people more than the instrument you know what i mean and you know he's my homie so like when, when we're working together he, he gets what i'm trying to say I, I i get his musicality all that kind of stuff and i and it's just fun to write for that because it gives me that, that gives me my most sense of purpose. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, and I can communicate that more than words or hanging, whatever. So uh, to me, that that's that's the most important part. You know, that sounds like a little, I, I don't know. It's not hippie or whatever. It's just, it's just true. Like, that's just how I feel. Um, and so I try to bring the, the most out of the music through that, challenging myself, challenging him, and, and the performance that I like to work with. And, and I always compare it. We just compare it to Bach and Gold, but, um, but I also like to compare, you know, like with Duke Ellington and his orchestra and stuff, like writing for the specific performance. And um, I, I just try to do that in general. And that, those are the type of projects I, I, I like to work with. Um, within performance, usually I like to really get to know them. And, but Ian is extra special because we, we've known each other for a while and ever, basically ever since I've been considered a composer or whatever, He's known my stuff better than me. <laughs> like all, all my percussion writing, we can be like, yo, start at letter S in this piece or whatever. And we both know what it is. Or he might know it better than me, you know what I mean? So just knowing that kind of thing and you know, uh, you know other examples, you know, like David Lang, Steve Schick, that kind of thing. You know, they, they develop or, or even or like the all stars and Dan McKenna, you know, it's stuff like that. You develop this deep bond and it really affects the music. Then it's more like it's more like almost being in a band or something instead of just like, here's the piece, learn it, um, study this and all that. I mean, that's part of it too, but it's, it's more of that collaborative project process, you know? And that's what I love about it, because I, I don't want to just, I'm not just sitting around writing in a basement, which is, which is another weird thing about this whole thing. I'm used to being like, I don't want to be you know, like in, in, in the trenches. <laughs> like, I like to, to, to watch this thing grow, too. And that's why I even write faster when we're together. Because I can be like, even if I'm pulling all nighters, like when we did the Manic Contemporary uh, Residency, like I was writing hyperspeed, because uh, I would just stay there, even like when they went home at night, and I'd be inspired by everything they did in the day, and that would give me energy to write all night. And then I'd just have stuff by the next morning, you know, and just, just keep working on it keep tight, tightening it up and then and then it's like a true collaboration to me you know what i mean yeah no i was just gonna say that like for, for me when i first met andy one of the first ways that i was introduced to him was through his his playing through his steel drum playing which if anyone watching this hasn't seen please pause and go go watch him play because it, it just it the 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 vir virtuosity the the expression the skill that he has on his instrument completely blew me away and i knew instant i knew instantly that i wanted to get to know this person i wanted to understand how he did the things he did i wanted to play his writing just i thought it was so so compelling and then as we started to work together i, I was i was equally blown away by the 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 way that he kind of held me to task like that there's just no bullshit when when we're talking with each other like if one of us messes up or does the wrong thing or whatever we tell each other that with no you know we're not trying to shame the other person or anything like that we're just telling it like it is and i think that that helps the two of us improve in a really in a really wonderful way so when we play together as a duo it's the the rehearsal process is really interesting because we're just kind of like 
we're kind of like sniping each other the whole time, just trying to make each other play better in a really honest way that comes from this respect and this friendship. There's no ego, there's no attitude, anything like that. We're just trying to make the performance better. And I feel like in a lot of the experiences that I have in my life playing with lots of different people, uh, that is a hard thing to find. And so when I found it or when we both found it, I think it's something that we grabbed onto. That's fantastic. And that's very, very visible and, and audible in your performances. That's why they're so memorable. Your collaborations really do have a very special type of energy. Hasty, you had something. Well, you know, speaking of, I mean, you, you mentioned a while ago the word process, and it just kind of triggered a, a question in my mind that we've had a lot of composers on this show, and it seems like Anytime we get some composer of your stature on the show, someone almost always asks, like, what's your compositional process? And I imagine you probably got that question a hundred times and you know exactly what to say and how to answer it. And I don't want to make you answer it again here. But what I'm more interested in knowing is why do you think that's such a mysterious thing to people? Like, how do we how should we tell people how to how to do that better, like how to start composing, what it means to be creative. Like why, are, why is that such a, a hard thing to grab onto for so many young people that aspire to do what you do? I think I can answer both of those simultaneously because it kind of, it, it does address that and it addresses the first question. Um, my, my main thing about my process is that I still don't know what the hell I'm doing. And I'm not just saying that to try to monitor anything. Like I'm still trying to figure out a process and maybe I will never figure it out. Um, and I don't mind because I'm still creating art and I'm trying to figure out the process. And, and what I mean by that is every time I start a new piece, it's almost a different thing. Even, even, you just, even the two pieces you just said that are very similar with electronics and, and snare drum, Completely different thought processes and, and architectural process, all that. Completely different. So if you ask me a specific piece, or even if you ask a specific beat of a piece or measure, I can tell you exactly where I was sitting, what I was thinking, what inspired that. But as far as like the whole piece, I don't have a MO or whatever it's called. I don't have it for anything. And that's even even going back to seven pillars. Almost all of those are even started in a different way, even though it's coming from a super extremely architectural, nerdy kind of place mathematically. But, and that's the only piece I've done like that. So er, kind of everything starts from a different place, but I know that really might not help be good advice to give like a, a young composer, but I think a lot of it is really, com it's, it's gonna sound a little trite, but if, as long as it comes from the heart, and from a good place and you know you're trying to make an experience, it's gonna be it's gonna be truthful to what you wanna do and what you wanna say. So so I can give you a couple of ways that I've started. And and uh, like for example, I do play the steel pan. I'm kind of lucky that it's a unique arrangement of notes. So maybe I'll think of melody different if I start on the steel pan. But then if I start on a on a piano, which is in order, the notes are in order. Because I'm so used to the circle fists or the whole tone scales of the steel of the different steel pans and the way they're arranged and being think, thinking circular, thinking to be shapes as I'm thinking of chords or anything like that, melodies, thinking in colors, all that. Then when I go to the piano, it feels completely different. And so even if I write from the piano, which I don't know how to play at all, um, it's it's gonna it's gonna have a little bit different, unique sound. Maybe because I'm coming from the pan, and vice versa. So then. A lot of it does come from intuition, whether I think architecturally at first or not. A lot of it is coming from improvisation, intuition, um, and just being inspired by my environment. That, that's physically too, whether I'm in a different city, if I'm in Rome, if I'm in Portland, if I'm in New York, my, my friends I'm hanging out with. It's really just me telling my story in life right then. As cheesy as that can sound, it's really true. And, and that, that speaks way further than some kind of way that I start a piece. And I feel like if more people did that in any art, it, it, I think it, it would bring out their true personality. I'm not saying anything would be greater, 
better or worse for it, but I think it will be more honest with what they want to do. And that, that's what I try to do. You know, a lot of my early compositions, all of them had pan in it because I, was, I wasn't trying to be a composer. I was just writing for myself and friends. And I wanted to expand the repertoire that I could play too. Because I really wanted to put this in with, with jazz and, and uh, contemporary classical music. So then when I started getting commissions and not writing for myself, I, um, yeah, I just think of different ways, whether I'm trying to sit by a harp for a couple of hours or prepare a piano or whatever. That was way too long, but you, you get my point? I'm sorry. Yeah. Like I, I was experiment and try different things. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Ben, did you do... have a Facebook question? <laughs> yeah, well, Andy, since you mentioned Steel Pan, we have a Facebook question from Hannah Williams. Hannah asks, how did you get into playing Steel Pan? I feel like most percussionists gravitate toward more traditional percussion instruments like marimba, drum set, timpani, etc. Awesome. Yeah, th this kind of, in a weird way, relates to the last answer, too. I just I love doing a lot of different things. So whether it's starting a piece a different way, I think I'm, it must be like the ADD side of me. I just, I can't repeat things so many, I can only do, you know what I mean? Like I can only do certain, if I, if I find myself saying something and then I just have to repeat, I just get, um, I don't know what it is. I, I don't even know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I, I can't, um, I can't try to do the same thing. I feel like I'm cheating if I do that. And it's it's not necessarily a good thing. It can be very bad, and that's why I'm so inefficient. That's why I'm always late, you know, because I'm always trying to figure it out. So with, with getting in the steel pan, it's the same kind of thing. I just love to do everything. And I was very lucky that I went to University of South Carolina for my undergrad, because it was like open to all that, you know? I just happened to pick steel pan, because um, I was, just at least is into West African drumming. I probably did more of that in undergrad. Uh, I did orchestra. I used to sub with the Philharmonic down there. I did uh, Brazilian um, drumming and, and, uh, and Afro-Cuban drumming and, and uh, drum line. I did a lot of that as a teenager and a little bit in college. And all that stuff, orchestra, concert band, all of that, you know, a lot of, a lot they end up finding their path of what they love to do. So for me, with Steel Pan, I ended up going to Trinidad a lot after college and just playing down with the bands on there. And that energy is what brought me to, to fall in love with the pan a little bit more. And also, as I was learning to read notes, like I could read any rhythms from, you know, drum line and stuff in, in high school, but I couldn't read pitches. I'd be like, every good boy does fine, face, all that. Even in college, I was reading out the, the, the beginning trumpet book, which is full notes. And I had to find the note on the marimba and like C. Like I was like, so I was learning pan the same time. And for some reason, I, I, I saw the patterns in a pan easier than a keyboard. Um, and so I, I, I just gravitated towards that. And then when I went, to, I went to North Texas for a student exchange and all my roommates were crazy jazzers. Like they were, it was big jazz scene and and i just i fell in love with jazz things i started getting introduced to some really cool stuff like i you know i fell in love with like late 50s bebop so i would i would try to transcribe all my favorite solos on the pen and that's how i really learned chromaticism that and then learning some bach and stuff like that really got me learning the skill pen and then i and i love the sound of it that's the other thing <laughs> i mean that's the main thing you know I, I just enjoy playing it and then i enjoyed writing and being creative with it you know i felt it was my it was definitely my vehicle into creativity for sure yeah. well as a as a follow-up to that we had uh well gender on uh, many many episodes ago and i remember asking him about this uh, and i think you guys our buddies um but we had a, a facebook question from brett morris he says what has been your inspiration for some of your extended techniques such as the use of chopstick and aka or rubber bands in to walk or run in harlem um and i know like chopsticks on steel pans seem to be a favorite oh yeah people hate that is that what you said no no i said it seemed to be a favorite oh <laughs> not um, sarcastic <laughs> yeah people really love that one <laughs> uh, for, for, uh, 
a lot of these comes from experimentation too. Um, and you, you bring up Valjinder. Uh, we were roommates in, at the University of South Carolina, and he's like, oh my, he's like a brother to me too. You know what I'm saying? Like we're, we're tight. Like um, we were just texting with him earlier today. Um, we, you know, we always experimented with stuff, and you know, like. I remember get, getting to New York and my friend Freddie Harris used to play with the backside of the sticks. Like we'd have like wooden sticks, right? And um, it's a cool sound. Like, I mean, you know, sometimes in the big steel pans, you, you flip the sticks around. I just think that hurts the instrument pretty quick. Like it, it, it sounds amazing, but the, the thickness of it can hurt. It can, it can be very abrasive on there unless you have the perfect touch like Freddie Harris does. Like you can, he can make a, a two octave steel pen sound like seven octaves. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> but he, he would turn the sticks around and like, and get these cool creative textures out of that too. And you know, I experimented with that too, but um, it's funny, it's, just, it's gonna sound cheesy, but around when I moved to New York, I kind of got in touch with my Japanese roots. And I started meeting the Japanese half of my family and started everybody like from my from my dad to extended relatives to all the Japanese side and of course um, I'm, I have chopsticks around more you know and being more cultured in New York you know I'm this country boy coming from South Carolina all of a sudden living in, in Brooklyn and you know I'm around a lot more cultures and everything but you know from Caribbean to Asian like so I, I just started messing around using chopsticks and I thought it was safer. And then over years and years, I found the perfect chopstick that works for me that I feel like brings the sound up the most and um, doesn't hurt the instrument. Because I, you know, when I, when I flip the sticks over, if I play, I'm going to put the instrument out of tune. I don't have that, that type of touch. But when it, with, the, with the chopsticks, I can feel it. The reason why I'm, I'm attracted to that sound is probably from drumline and hyper articulate, vertically aligned, perfect rhythmic, you know? So I love that sound of that articulation and me getting so in the pan, I lost a lot of that because pan's so, such a round sound. You hear at least as much overtone as you do the fundamental, right? So when you use chopsticks, you get a lot of that piercing articulation, but you still get the green. So then that brings me to, Vibraphone. Okay, now with vibraphone, how do I recreate what I was thinking of with pan with the chopsticks? Oh, timbali sticks, and it doesn't hurt the vibraphone. You know what I mean? You, you, you can play pretty hard with that. And then, okay, ligneus, the marimba piece. I'm still attracted to that sound. I'm not trying to do it to do something different. I just really love that sound. How can I recreate this without hurting the instrument? And luckily, I was at Yo, at the end, and they let me use the percussion studio at three in the morning when nobody was practicing. Um, and they they let me stay there and work there. And I, you know, you know, I was I was a little nervous, but I was like practicing with the back sides, those kind of things, and doing the resonators and making sure I wasn't scratching the room. But I don't want to hurt anything that I want to create. So then also, so now if we back up because you asked about Harlem too. So that was in two thousand eight. Um, in 2008 and 2007, I started learning about string instruments at Manhattan School. So I started meeting a lot of contemporary, actually just classical musicians. I didn't know one classical musician when I moved to New York. So for the first seven years or whatever. So I'm back in school, meeting all these incredible violinists, cellists, all that. And I learned about Bartok pits. You know, I probably heard about it before, but never really paying attention. I'm like, man, how can I recreate that on the pen? So I started. I started messing around with a board pan, which is the pan with all the holes in it, right? And I put the I put uh, paper clips through, and and I, I I used to have longer hair, and I would braid them, or put dreads and stuff, or not dreads, but I'd braid them with the, the little black rubber bands, and um, I still had a whole bunch of those, so I put those in there and created like this this hyper steel pan. It's in the 21 video, if you ever see that, there's a steel pan, it takes way too long, it takes like three hours to prepare, so I don't do it like that anymore. But you can create like these, what's cool about that is you can create a Bartok Pitts with like four or five notes, because you, you, you bounce the rubber band into the metal. And I just wanted to, I wanted to recreate string techniques with percussion. So when I ordered, the rubber bands I had, were they were old and they were cheap from like Dwayne Reed or somewhere, and they, they were from a pharmacy, right? From uh, 
And so they, they weren't made to be doing that. They're just made for the hair, these tiny rubber bands, right? So they kept breaking. So I studied, I went online and tried to find like really strong rubber bands. And I found these, they're the same size, but they're like the real deal from this company, right? So when um, they sent me the batch of these, I was like, can you throw in some or samples of other types of rubber bands? I don't even know if I asked or if they just did it. And they, they put in this sample of a 9G, and I was like, man, this looks fun. What can I do with this? And then I started thinking, man, what if I could recreate that pan Bartok fits on a marimba or a vibraphone? So then put on the vibraphone and, and wrote to walk around West Harlem around that, you know? It's really just like being a, like a kid in a sandbox, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like in a, in a playroom, you got all these things, you're given all these tools, how do you make a sound, you know? It's like York, you know what I mean? Like you can make a sound with anything, but it's, it's, I think, I think a lot of people think I just do that just to try to do something different or whatever, but yeah, sure. Why not? But it's really because it's, it's just, I don't know how much technique on normal things and, or, or whatever, you know what I mean? Like I can't play piano, but all that kind of stuff, but I want to, if you give me a violin, I'm going to figure out a way to create sounds from it. Um, whether I know anything about it or not, and I don't want to hurt the instrument too. And I just do that with percussion. I just happen to know percussion really well, so I can go a little bit further. I can be like, oh, I know a dreadlock will work on this. Let me try that. I, I remember dreadlock. I had some extra ones from drum corps. So I had dreadlocks, pooillies, any of that stuff. I'm like, man, you know, you can be inspired by all these different sounds. Why not throw them on the classical instruments too and, and make a, a marimba more than just playing it with the regular knot head and stuff? You know, there's a lot of limitless possibilities. We've done it with strings. Why not do it more with percussion? And a lot of people are doing that, and it's good. It's inspiring. Um, that's All fantastic. Right. Um, I have a follow-up question. I was listening to your pre-premiere talk um, for the percussion concerto that you did with Colin Curry um, in the Oregon Symphony, and I was wondering that you mentioned that that was the first time that you actually treated the marimba as a marimba. Um, that was the first time that you tried to write for the instrument, as most other people do. So what's that been like? And when are we going to be able to hear that concerto? Um, is there a recording sometime after the world ends or something planned? I'm trying to get the recording with Oregon Symphony and Colin doing the premiere. And he did an awesome job. I mean, that, that, that symphony's really great here. It was, everybody killed it. So it's really cool. You know how it's it's hard to get recorded sometimes with orchestras, and we're working on that. I think, it, and then also uh, Sean Rittenauer from New York played at Huntsville, and Word on the Street is something might come out next week or something with the the first movement. Um, I hope we'll see because <laughs> uh, we gotta everybody's gotta get permission to use recordings and video and that kind of stuff. Um, and the second uh, the percussion tries marimba and I just chose to do it normal because I don't know I just that's the timbre I wanted to hear for that one but it but um my my original plan was yeah that would be a normal movement and then I would have like an interlude a duet with uh maybe trumpet or clarinet and uh marimba with the other sticks too um the, the ligneous type sticks I, I never went that route because it, it ended up not matching the whole overall arc of the piece. So there's only one interlude in the percussion in general. Um, I didn't want it to get too long, and I, I felt like it, I said what I needed to say. So maybe I'll do another duet or something outside of that piece. But it, there was no rhyme or reason why I chose to make it regular marimba. It's just what I wanted for that movement. Um, more the feeling of what needed to be there in the whole overall piece. Is that outweighed any, any need to use those sticks? It just didn't make sense musically for that. That's cool. Well, since we have Ian here, I wanted to ask Ian, when you get a piece from Andy and it says wrap a rubber band around a marimba bar, like what, what goes through your head? <laughs> well, I feel like that's evolved a little bit over the years. It's like, Perhaps when Andy and I, uh, when we had first met, we didn't know each other that well, I probably thought 
something closer to what I would think from other composers, which is like, okay, did this person think this through? Is this going to hurt the instrument? What's this going to sound like? Have they tried it to make sure that that the logistics of what they're asking for actually works? But now the the thing, one of the many things I know about Andy is that when he tells me to, you know, go to the hardware store and buy this exact dowel and then wrap it with this mulch or whatever it happens to be, I know that he's done it 10 times. And not only that, but he's tried every other version of it. And this really is the best version of it, at least in this moment, and it will definitely work. And the the thing about working with Andy that is so wonderful is he's he's so preoccupied and he's so concerned about how the performer feels when they're on stage playing his piece. And so if I tell him that, like, you know, actually, man, it's really uncomfortable to do this, like it hurts or I don't I'm not it's not a reliable technique or whatever, then he'll stop what he's doing and try to figure out another way to do it so that I feel better about doing it on stage. And, and I think that 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 is that is sometimes a thing that is not as easy with, with, with a composer as I find it is with Andy. And I think it has a lot to do with, with his performer background, that he spent so much time on stage. He knows what it feels like to stand up on stage doing something that doesn't feel it, idiomatic, doesn't feel like it's an extension of, of your body. And and it's uh, it's great to work with him with extended techniques. And it's it's not only with percussion, I've seen him do this with when he writes for all other instruments. Like, uh, you know, I think, Andy, when you wrote your harp piece, you like borrowed a harp for a couple of months to, to just to figure out everything you could about this instrument, about the pedals and all of the different technical aspects of playing this instrument that that you don't play. And I think it, it does so much for the performer. It builds so much trust with the performer. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say a couple of notes on that. One is in the the performer notes for Stop Speaking, uh, that piece involves doing finger rolls, thumb rolls, finger rolls, whatever, on, on snare drum, which for many people and maybe even many snare drums, just the equipment itself is not reliable. And in the performer's notes, Andy actually suggests like you can do something else, like if, if that technique isn't comfortable for you. And it, it reminds me what you're saying about getting getting the hands on the instrument. Uh, when Sharinsky wrote uh, His Story to Soldat, like that's what he did with the drums. He went, got the drums, set them out on his floor, he, you know, couldn't play them at the level of maybe Alan Abel, but he could, you know, figure out, oh, if I go like this between these two drums, it, it works or whatever. So, yeah, it's interesting yeah. to hear that. Well, Andy, did you want to talk at all about your, your process? Like w when you have an instrument that you don't that you don't know, that you don't actually play, how do you go about learning it so that you can write something that does feel comfortable for the performer? Yeah, like if we ask, can you write a piece for theremin, what would you do? <laughs> yeah. Uh I mean, I would definitely grab a theremin and at least understand how it works. And for, I mean, I'd probably play it for 20 hours and play it the next day for 20 more. I, uh, yeah, and I would try to listen to as much things out there. But actually, I'm better at I'm I'm better at being in the field doing it. Um, I would get more mileage out of just having a theremin than to listen to a thousand hours of theremin music. It just doesn't sink into my brain as much as physically tactile doing things. Uh, I'm just a very hands-on person. I'd rather build a house. You know I mean, like I, I work more like that, and I learn better like that. I can't really learn by just listening to a teacher. I have to. I have to really be involved or I don't learn anything. Or I don't retain it at least. You know what I mean? So when I you know, if I'm if I have a harp or if I'm borrowing a cello or something, I don't need to learn how to play a perfectly in tune C scale, but I can get a lot of ideas. I can figure out, oh, even if double stops are possible or whatever, or just figuring out why things make a harmonic, that kind of stuff. But it, it you know, my learning curve takes a while to get to where I can do something listenable anyway. So I, a lot of times things will come out of that that um, I think can be specific for a new sound for that type of instrument, for the harp or whatever it might be. She I'm still <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, Casey. Oh, I was just going to say something fun about theremin. Did you guys know you have to tune a theremin by assessing like where 
the lowest pitches with your own magnetic body field like everyone like so you know the low c for me is here but i'm a smaller i have a smaller body than ian so that same pitch for ian is going to be like somewhere else so anyway theremins are cool but <laughs> and i and i love that you said you have you like to get your hands on it because i've been in this discussion lately with a, a friend of all of ours i'm sure Corey hills we're talking about like oh you know how people should be composing and how much of it should be from an idiomatic place or not or whatever it's been like really fun conversation but um yeah one of the things i i tried to say is like what ben said like no there's a reason stravinsky like grabbed the instruments like tried it like we want pieces to lay well we want them to be possible but there is definitely this movement now of composers that say like oh i have this vision and i'm imagining the sound I don't care if it works, good luck figuring it out. But I, I don't think composers used to do that. I mean, I think they spent huge quantities of effort to try to figure out heart pedalings, to try to figure out violin fingerings, to try to figure out what it is like to play a theremin. I mean, it's why, you know, it's why Beethoven's piano rep is better than his opera. It's because he knows how to, you know, because it's because that matters. You know, anyway, but um, that was it. Ian, I think you had had something to add. Oh yeah, well I, I was gonna I was gonna switch gears entirely. Um, a a Andy, I wanted to ask you a little bit about this set of older pieces, some of the first pieces that you ever wrote, the the synesthesia suite. Um, j just to talk a little bit about the genesis of those pieces and how, uh, be being someone who has synesthesia yourself, how that influences your performing and and your composing. I mean, those are the, those are the pieces that got me into writing music. Um, I never wrote any of those down at first, um, and and it, it all started with Akka, and even starting with that piece, it started because I was in a band um, downtown in, in my neighborhood in Chinatown. Um, we had, uh, I was playing steel pan, we had alto sax, steel pan, African balafon, um, congas, uh, guitar, and bass, and drums. Um, and so I wrote Akka around the balafon. Like it had, it was diatonic, it was in A minor, or it was the white keys, basically, right? So there wasn't even a G sharp. So yeah, there's, it was all natural. The one he had, my friend Brian. Um, and I just wanted to write a riff, an asinat around that. So I just messed around with that. That's what came to, that's why that repetitive thing in Akka is what it is. And that's why it's so repetitive. And I, I just wrote a piece around that. And um, around that time, I had just gotten back from Trinidad and I started associating colors with pitch um, in a kinesthetic way. So every time I would physically play or think of a D, I would see orange in Akka or red in Japanese is A. So I, uh, and then after writing Akka, I, I got inspired to write more and then I wanted to write a full suite, but most of them were just solos, so, except that. And Akka's never existed like that anymore as well. So it, it, all of those pieces, they're all based on, um, they're very modal in, in these key centers and they come out of my more background in trying to learn jazz and sitting in a jazz clubs in New York. And then to bring this back to Bausinger, who was up at Eastman working on his PhD at the time, and working on his master's and PhD, um, I would go visit him in the summer, and he let me use their computer music studio to record, and I recorded a whole album of just me playing a pen on these solo pieces. So that's why I wrote Kara Kara and I up there. I always woke up one morning where I was staying up there and uh, just put magnets on the steel pen and started messing around with that and then wrote that but they were all just super spontaneous pieces most of them took about five minutes to write um uh and then the different orchestrations that were took a while like because it was it was super intuitive like murasaki the uh, purple i just i because i've been playing a lot of bob marley i used to try to play all the melodies and the bass line and the comping and all that and so i just i walked up in my pen one day um this was like in 2006, and I, ju I just played it in the middle of the night, and I just played it from top to bottom, and that was it. It, it never changed, really, the, the pan part. And um, 
a lot of pieces were like that with that that's why they're so simple they're, they're really simple pieces and um and it, it 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 was all intuitive and that that inspired me to write i never thought i'd be a composer but that's those kind of things inspired me to write and and those are constantly evolving because <laughs> it, it they can work for any instrumentation you know Well, Andy, one of the pieces you mentioned from the Synesthesia Suite is uh, Karakura and I, and that I heard, I think, I think Ian was the first person I heard play that. Um, but anyway, I, I love that piece. I adore that piece. And one of my favorite things about it, I like, I like weird music. Uh, and it's, it's actually, uh, for anyone that's unfamiliar, basically the left hand ostinato, or it's like, I think the right hand if you're playing on steel pan, but the, the bass part ostinato, is in 3116 and the other part, the right hand part of playing on marimba is straight quarter notes the entire time. And so it's actually in a sense unnotatable. Um, you can, I mean, you can force notation to, to work for that, but basically you have to write out one part, write out the other part and the performer has to fuse them together. And the score now I think includes the written out version, which I can't, Read and bigger yeah. the thought of trying to to read <laughs> um but in my uh in my i guess you could call it quarantine insanity here i for some reason started reading about the history of the metronome uh and i that piece sticks with me so much when i think about metronomic music and so i wanted to share with everyone a little bit of my findings about the the history of the metronome so here we go everyone on a little history lecture about the metronome um, so there was a, an Andalusian inventor, scientist, kind of polymath guy by the name of Abbas Ibn Firnas, pardon my pronunciation of the name, who lived from eight, uh, 810 to 887. Um, and he was actually one of the first people to deal with gliders and uh, one of the first people ever to fly. And he created an inverted pendulum device that could be set to beat at a regular interval. I tried to find a picture of it, but I couldn't. He also invented a water clock, which is what usually came up when I searched for stuff. Uh, in 1581, Ga uh, Galileo started studying pendulums, and he found that the uh, period, which is like the amount of time it would take, had a regular interval regardless of the amplitude. So in other words, if something was... If you had the same weight of pendulum and it was swinging two feet versus three inches, it actually took the same amount of time to cross that uh, path. So that was sort of a breakthrough. And then uh, about 100 years later, in 1696, there was a French musical theorist by the name of Etienne Lully, who applied Galileo's principles of the pendulum to create a metronome which was basically just a calibrated adjustable pendulum. So it was just a pendulum that I guess had some sort of marks where you could shorten or lengthen it to, to get different tempos. Um, it did not make sound, it was visual only. You had to watch it if you wanted to see how fast it was going. And it also, just the mechanics of a pendulum, it couldn't beat slowly enough for a lot of music. So it could not beat tempos down to 40 to 60 beats per minute. Um, so that was the next step. And then in 1814, there was, a, I think he was German inventor by the name of Dietrich Winkel, who created a musical chronometer is what he called it. And it had a double weighted pendulum, which meant there was a weight at both the top and the bottom that could produce slower tempi. He wanted to share this idea. So he donated it to the Royal Institute of Sciences, Literature and Fine Arts in Amsterdam, without patenting the idea. Um, and this is where, if you're familiar with computers, there was like Xerox developed a computer and then Apple sort of stole it. This sort of happened with metronomes. Um, so there was another inventor by the name of Johann Meilzel, who was a German inventor, engineer and showman. Uh, a couple of his other interesting things about him was he invented an instrument called a panharm panharmonicon, which was a musical automaton capable of playing all the military band instruments. Uh, he also displayed something called a mechanical Turk machine, which was invented by Wolfgang von Kippelin, um, which was basically a, a machine that could play chess. Um, and it was fraudulent because there was actually a very small chamber for someone to sit inside of it and operate levers. Um, but both Benjamin Franklin and Napoleon played against his mechanical chess machine and lost. 
he also invented an improved ear trumpet, which was an early hearing aid. This guy became friends with Beethoven around 1813. Beethoven seemed to be fascinated by his inventions. Uh, and so Miles Zill conceived and musically sketched the Beethoven piece Wellington's Victory, which Beethoven completed, uh, which was actually written for that panharmonic and harmonicon instrument that I, I mentioned. Um, and so um, in 1814, Miles Zill traveled to Amsterdam to, uh, and he witnessed, the, uh, sorry, to showcase his panharmonicon, and he witnessed Winkle's musical chronometer and effectively stole the idea. And in 1815, he just added a graduated scale so you could affect the speed of oscillation, and he renamed it the metronome from the Greek words for measure and I manage. He produced 200 of these devices, sent them to musical acquaintances, including Beethoven for suggestions. And in 1816, he founded a metronome building factory in Paris. Uh, Beethoven was the first notable composer to include metronome markings in his music. And it's been speculated because some of them were erratic that maybe Beethoven's metronome actually malfunctioned. But if you, I didn't know this until I did my research. If you've ever seen MM on music, I always thought that just stood for metronome marking, but it actually stands for Milesel's metronome. So that's what that comes from. Um, and so uh, fast forwarding through time in 1909, um, there was a pocket metronome invented by White and Hunter, where a hand would complete a complete revolution at a given tempo in 1838. Uh, there was a metronome produced called a Franz metronome. I think the company was Franz that took advantage of controlled alternating current to produce the first electromechanical metronome. So this was not a digital metronome, but it used the alternating current, which would you know go at 120 hertz to to measure time. And then in the 1970s, digital electronic metronomes came out with actual circuit boards in them. And then obviously in the 2000s, uh, with smartphones becoming popular, we now have app-based metronomes. Interestingly, I found that the metronome was criticized by Mendelssohn, Wagner, Verdi, and Brahms. They all thought it led to too uh, mechanical of a performance. And I think that maybe they weren't thinking of it as a teaching tool like we generally do now. Uh, but all of them have criticisms that it sort of took the human spirit out of music. The metronome inspired the second movement of Beethoven's Eighth Symphony with its repetitive ticking sound. There have been a few pieces that feature metronomes as musical instruments, uh, probably the most famous of which is uh, Georg Ligeti, or sorry, Georg Ligeti's uh, Poem Symphonique from 1962 for 100 metronomes, which Casey has recorded two years prior to that. The Japanese composer Toshi Ichinagi had composed a piece called Music for Electronic Metronomes. Uh, Casey actually has one or two pieces for fancy metronomes, one of which I know features the Bilotti trinome. And uh, the drummer from ACDC, whose name is Phil Rudd, is known as the Melbourne metronome. So Phil that Rudd. is uh, probably more than anyone ever needed to know about metronomes, but pretty fascinating stuff, I think. Um, and yeah, I actually, I, in my practice, I recently, for whatever reason, again, quarantine insanity, I've wanted to practice fivelets. Um, and so I had to find a, a metronome app that could subdivide fivelets. And so uh, it's called Pro Metronome, if you want to check that on the App Store, highly recommended. But uh, yeah, that was my, uh, my metronome findings. You're welcome. <laughs> I like that. I like that article, Ben, because it really it was it wasn't that long. There's a ton of information, and it just really explained. It makes so much sense. Yeah, pendulums, and then pendulum operated clocks, like a grandfather clock, right? There's that thing that swings in the middle. It's just a pendulum, and then yeah, turn that around and metronome. You know, make sure it makes a sound, and and then that's yeah. that's it. It's a, it's weird that like metronome came so much after those things it's all like the same technology you know yeah so so just two sorry two other notes uh one like i said that the guy that invented a metronome in the 800s couldn't find anything about it but it said it was an inverted pitch pendulum device that could be set to beat at a regular interval so that sounds actually pretty advanced compared to the next couple of steps i reported there's one other thing I wanted to add. There's a, a device called an escapement, uh, which is used in like pendulum clocks, if you've ever seen those. And the escapement is basically what allows the uh, the, the wind-up spring to like power the pendulum without affecting the, the speed of it. And if you like Google it, you can find images. But um, And I couldn't tell. It seemed like either Winkle or Milesil invented that. I think it was probably Winkle. But anyway, yeah, metronomes, man. 
<laughs> Andy's either going to write a piece for a metronome now or is never going to come near one <laughs> after this. <laughs> Or will from here on out no longer write any metronomic music. <laughs> ben, you know, you mentioned that Bellotti trinome, and I know I've talked about it on the show before, but for those of you that don't know, this is an electronic metronome, 1970s, and it's really fascinating. It's totally, it's, you plug it in, it's electric, but the electric the, the electrical uh, component just runs a motor and the motor spins. Yeah, there's this a long cylinder. Electromechanical metronome is what that. Category. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's an electrical run mechanical metronome. It's mechanical, which is whatever. That's fine. But it's polyrhythmic. So it has these slots, one through eight. And you can do three of them at a time, hence the name trinome. So you can click one of the levers. Uh, to say one, and then another one of the levers to two, three, four, five, six, or seven, or eight. And you can have any three combination of these. And all the levers control is which measurement you're on in the spinning cylinder. So the number two slot, for instance, has two notches on the cylinder that are evenly spaced. The number three has three notches that are equally spaced, so on and so forth to eight. So it's really cool to show students you know, if you're wondering what is polyrhythm, just open up this thing and just show them. It's like there it is actually happening. It's not a computer trick. It's not super, um, you, know, you know, super cerebral performance thing and like crazy hyper subdivisions and pass the goddamn butter, pass the goddamn. It's none of that. It's not that at all. It's just measurement. It's just equal measurement. And here's five, here's three, and they're taking up the same quantity of space, which in this metronome's case is one rotation. Casey out. That's really cool. Good job. <laughs> so, Andy, we have a, a question from our Facebook listener, Garrett Adams. He says, of all of your pieces, which one was your favorite to work on or which one had the most rewarding experience come along with it? I have to think about that. Um, they all have, a, I mean, I, I enjoy all of them for different reasons, or the process of, like I said, working with performers on them. And um, I guess it would have to be more of a specific question. Like, um, for me, I like listening to Key Era, and that process was super intuitive to me. I mean, it was just, it came super quick, and I, I just like how it sounds to listen to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there's no, there's no, there's nothing more than that, really. I, I like, you know, to say about it. Um, but but it, it just depends on the mood I'm in. Like if I, if um, it's just like any other music I listen to. Maybe sometimes I'm in the mood to hear heavy metal or hip-hop or Beethoven or you know what I mean like it it's, it's the same so it, it probably changes and, and it, it's more about um the specific either performances of it or or um different processes there, there's not any but I, I I mean I always I feel like to me key hero is just really it's all there for me. It's, it's fun to listen to for me, and it's it's got all the architecture, all the things that hit me in the subconscious, and um, I just I enjoy it, I guess. But uh, but I don't. I, I've worked the the process of working on many of the other pieces has been probably more fulfilling because it was it was harder, and you know you learn a lot about. I've learned a lot about myself and about other people through writing the other pieces, too. So, I'm not sure. Yeah, sorry about that. It's a hard question. It's a little bit like asking a parent, who's your favorite child, maybe. Every parent can answer that. <laughs> they just don't want to. <laughs> don't want to deal with the consequences. Um, I have a, a question for both of you guys. Um, uh, you both are so successful and um, we try to cover a good range of topics from, you know, your in 
intrinsic motivation and drive to your history to to a little bit of like what's it like to be in this business and, and make a living and I guess the question for uh, both Andy and Ian is do you remember a cornerstone moment in your career when you realized a I can do this I guess I guess this is it like personally I feel fine and b I guess I can make a living I'm still looking for that <laughs> New York I, film. I, and I, I appreciate saying, maybe, I don't know, there's certain success or I, I've got a long way to go um, to live off of this and to to grow artistically. So I'm still looking for that. But there's always there's always milestones, like you said. You know, like I remember specific moments, but almost everything I've done is one big just growth, whether it's good or bad experiences, because sometimes we learn more from the, the really bad experiences that don't work out. And those are the ones you happen to remember more, because they just, they, they burn in that memory. So not to be negative or anything, but a, a lot of, a lot of the, the things that I've grown and overcoming those really hard times, um, whether it's musically or in life, that, that's, that, those are the milestones I think. But those are the ones that we forget to talk about, I think, you know? <laughs> definitely, <But> definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I, I guess for me, I, I, well, some something that someone told me that a teacher, a former teacher told me that I, I think is true and I think about all the time is that if when, when you're when you're considering what you want to do with your life and you're considering whether whether being in, in this crazy business that we're all in is what you want to do, what what they told me was if you could uh, if you could envision yourself doing anything else as your job if you can envision any other career path for yourself they recommended that I pursue that other career path because going down this this path is it's it's a really it's a really unique thing it's a really it's a really special thing uh, if you if you do it and you stick with it the the rewards are so great um, but it's not like a super financially viable thing. It's not a thing that any of us do to get rich uh, at, at all. You, you do it because it's the only thing that you can do. And so, I mean, I, I was fortunate when I was actually in high school, um, I, I met this really wonderful teacher, this guy named Simon Boyer. I don't know if you guys know him, uh, who I started taking lessons with when I was in high school. He was the first one to introduce me to contemporary music, uh, to any of the percussion instruments that, that we all play. I was the drum set player. That was kind of all I did. And he was the first one to show me what some of these other possibilities were. And it, it just blew me away. And it, and it was, I mean, it wasn't right. It, it wasn't, I can't point to one lesson or something like that, but it was the the couple of years that I studied with him that kind of it was the first time I had ever considered going to college to study this, to really think about making it the, the thing that I would do. And little by little, I just found that this was the only thing for me, that there are not, like, at the, I can't imagine doing anything else in, in my life. And, and the financial part of it, it just never really came into the equation. Like, when I graduated school, I didn't have a bunch of performance opportunities. I didn't have a bunch of fancy jobs or anything like that. But I didn't care. I also knew at that moment that I didn't need to make a lot of money. I didn't have a family or responsibilities like that. And so I was just like, I'm going to move to Brooklyn because that's where all my friends live. And I'm just going to do stuff. And it doesn't matter if I get paid to do it right now. I'll figure that part out sometime down the line. Uh, just because it made me happy to to do that. Um, so, so yeah, I'm not sure what, what, what to say other than that. But it's just I, I think that all of us probably share the same thing that this is just the only thing that we can imagine ourselves doing. Definitely. That's like yeah. such a such a beautiful remark. And I hate to follow it up with a question that's not nearly as beautiful. <laughs> but I just had a question for Andy. I would be I would be so pissed at myself if I didn't ask about this because one of my favorite pieces by Andy, if not my favorite piece, and I teach a music appreciation class and I always show this piece to them, is your concerto ricochet, uh, which is for violin, percussion, and two ping pong or table tennis players. I don't know the difference or the correct term, but um, I, I like I, I don't even know where to start asking you about that piece. Like I know, like I think Ian told us about it on Ian's episode actually, but it was like a commission or I don't know. I'm gonna stop talking. Can you just tell us about Ricochet? <laughs> yeah. Um... After I wrote the, I wrote a piece, Oscillate, in New York Phil, 
um, for their contact series in 2012. And violinist Elizabeth Seltzer from there um, heard my, I mean, she played in that piece and saw where I came from, the rhythmic background and all that kind of stuff. And I didn't meet her then, but um, I, she, she gave my a CD, um, she gave my CD to uh, Jean Jacques at Cami Music, and um, and one day they they emailed me out of the blue to meet at um, Spin, the ping pong club in New York. It's like a nightclub for ping pong. I was like, okay, that's strange. Meeting like late at night at, at a ping pong club. That's cool. So I was like, man, this is cool. This is like, all right. Like I, I thought it was some kind of I, I didn't know what we were meeting or talking, maybe, maybe talking about a new piece or some kind of management or something. I didn't know. I was like, all right, this is cool. You know, so I, I went there and we went to the back room. It was like this private kind of room. There's actually a really cool story about Prince and uh, Jimmy Fallon in that room, that same room. The Prince beats Jimmy Fallon and, and he goes to get the ball and Prince disappears and texts me or something. <laughs> like another crazy Prince story. But, so we met in this room and um, he's talking about uh, this piece and I thought he was joking. I was like, you kidding me, right? Because I thought it was just like, because we're meeting there. And, and, um, and they, they were talking about um, doing this soon too, within the next year. And I was like, I, I, I just think it'd be impossible for me to pull off. And, and, and I, you know, I'd be interested in doing it one day and, and we made it happen couple years later like about two years later we really got it going um but i think the more interesting side of the story um i, I just thought it was really cool that they thought us but also when i was writing uh, this piece ligneous um ian does a lot for marimba and string quartet i wrote a lot of it on a, just literally using a ping pong table as as a desk <laughs> and um i remember uh, playing around with it. So this was back in 2010. And I remember playing like, man, it'd be cool to write a piece for this one day. So it was already in there. <laughs> but it was crazy that that's just how, is the right word serendipity and all that works, you know, like, just when the stars align like that, it's like, yeah, I would always kind of want to do this, but it wasn't my idea. A lot of people think, yo, how did you think of that? And I think it's a really cool idea, but also I think if it's not done right, it could be really bad. <laughs> you know, because I, I I'm already they hear what I'm writing for, or if I'm putting other bands and stuff, they're they're thinking I'm um they might, you know, there might be some negative thoughts about that. Uh, just because it's like, oh that that looks like a um a novelty trick or some bullshit, you know, like I play steel pan. I play steel pan because I love it, not because I'm trying to do I don't nobody has time to do stuff for novelty, I think, you know, unless they're doing it for the wrong reasons. But so even when I got, I heard the idea, even at the club, I was like, man, I'm already kind of known for like, but then I started saying, who cares? I don't care what I'm looking for. I just want to make a good experience. So then like, I thought about it after that meeting. And cause at first I was like, man, this, this is kind of crazy. You know, like this is almost like career ending, like is this selling out. What, what is this? Like, I'm already kind of known for like doing quirky things. Like, I, you know, writing a steel pen or doing all this stuff. And now I was like, no, man, let me, let me be mature about this. Like, it is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I, I'm super grateful that they even thought of me to do this. And like, what can I do to make this an experience and not be some bullshit novelty? Like, how can I make music out of this and make it respectable and make it fun, not take it too serious too? Because then you could go too far with that, right? So I wanted to kind of just bring something that would bring us all together, whether you're a musician or not, or ping pong, whatever. So obviously they, they knew the right people um, and they, they, they got these really amazing uh, table tennis players, uh, Ariel and Michael, and they were like the youngest national champions ever in the US. And there's this documentary on them on Netflix and all this. And, and uh, so I, I was super fortunate to be able to work with them and just and meet with them and, and also meet with, this also, it, it involved Elizabeth, who 
introduced us all. And so we wanted to get her part of it. You know, she's part of the team. She's an awesome violinist. So I was thinking, all right, she'll be like the ambassador to the ping pong players, the orchestra. And then the percussionist, I was thinking David Kossin, and they had also worked with David before with the water concerto and stuff like that. So I, I was thinking it'd be great and, and we're neighbors and stuff. And, and uh, you know, David Kossin, like Simon with Ian, they, David, I learned a lot from through Ben and Ken when I was getting into contemporary classical music and all that. And, you know, I wanted to bring him in this too. And it was just this, I just thought it was like a cool team. And, and we we met at Kassin's studio a lot. And I would meet the ping pong players. And I was like, you know, what stuff you do to practice and rehearse? Like, like what do you guys do to, to get your skills up? Like, what's your training like? They would show me stuff like, all right, the multi-ball technique where somebody just stands on the other side and throws the balls. It's like an accelerando. And I was like, there's a condenser right there. We're going to put a bass drum here. And it's just going to keep getting faster and faster. And the, the video on YouTube is actually like a fourth attempt that she does that. Like, all the performances after that, so it's, it, it's like super crazy, like exciting how she does that. And it's just the technique that they, they have to do. So how can we apply those skills? And then me and Carson would spend hours just messing around we did some silly things like we'd take stuff and bounce it across the vibraphone and be like oh since elizabeth has perfect pitch you know maybe she can match it and we just thought of all these different things a lot of it didn't actually happen like maybe five percent of the ideas but just having that fun experimental thing playing with so then i was living in rome for a year and um when i was writing his part i had a lot of terracotta from the roofs and I, I wrote a lot of it on there. And there was a ping pong table across the street from where I was living. And they, and they, they let, where I was at the, the American Academy, they let me bring the ping pong table over and put it in my studio. So I did. I had. The, um, I had it there, uh, um, and uh, and was able to just play on that for a while and, and come up with stuff right there. And uh, I don't know. And then and then put that together with the orchestra and. It, it was a crazy thing. It was a lot of fun to um, just work really hard on that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There's there's all no. kinds of experimentation with that. But but I wanted I wanted to make it on. Um, I wanted to make it about the music too, and and not just exploit the ping pong part. Of it. I go off on a lot of tangents, but I hope I hope that gets to the point. See, I think you left. <laughs> Absolutely. It's so and it's so interesting. I find I, I've heard you talk about this a lot uh, about how the space that you're in impacts your writing. And that's why you switch coffee shops, but also cities and so on. And I I didn't know how much the exact city that you're in, like the actual space um, influences you at a conscious level. But it seems to be not only subconsciously, but very consciously as well. So I think it's really Really, really interesting to hear you talk about that. Very, you have uh, fantastic creative processes. Um, really fun to listen to. I, I just, I like to be around people and, and energy. It, 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 it keeps me motivated to write and come up with new ideas, you know, but. Um, um, speaking of uh, which, I just wanted to uh, put this uh, in here. Um, Dr. Robert ha Carnahan um, asked for his follow-up <laughs> Frost Wind Ensemble piece, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> so speaking of people and energy, I was there when we premiered, I, I was in the ensemble when we premiered uh, your piece on the Inns epilogue, um, and it was super fun to work with you, but I know that he is very hungry for a new piece, so just so you know, that's another thing on your plate. <laughs> that, was, that was a lot of fun writing and working with you guys and it sounded amazing. You guys, these guys sounded great. It was um, so cool, so exciting. Yeah, I definitely want to do more in that world. I, I feel like I was just getting been out of that theme for so long, for over 20 years. So it was, it was nice to, to revisit that life a little bit. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The band world is very hungry for your music, so I'm sure there's going to be plenty of work there for you. Um, Kylie, you had another question, yeah? Yeah, speaking a little bit about influences, um, Brian Bloom writes to Andy, love your work, Andy. Can you talk about some of the most influential musicians in your work as a composer? 
could include teachers, other artists, bands, etc., who have influenced the music that you write. I know you used to love Guns N' Roses. I heard you say that. I thought that was really <laughs> cool. I totally related. I like screamed when I heard that thing on the podcast. Yeah, like 1987. So I was listening to uh, Metallica. I saw them in concert. My, my sister was a drummer, so she got me into all that stuff. She had a, a Tama Rockstar double kick. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, yeah, I, I grew up with, with a lot of that, Led Zeppelin and everything. And grew up with a lot of hip hop and, uh, and rock. And uh, I don't know, I got, I got more into classical music in college and meeting classical musicians. I, I kind of like everything. I mean, I like, I like the best of everything, you know? <laughs> Like there's, whether it's, it doesn't matter the genre, but um, so as far as my influences, it can be anything from, you know, Trinidad and Calypso, you know, whether it's um, like Ray Home and Boogie Sharp, um, that kind of stuff, uh, jazz, like I said earlier, I, I really like, like 50s, bebop and stuff. I, I love Miles Davis prestige albums and, and um, and then, you know, class crew, I like all the, I like the greatest hits thing, you know. But I, I, I like, um, I don't know, anything from Jez Waldo to Michaud to, you know, all, all those cats. And, and then the, Beethoven's like my favorite ever. Um, the late string quartets, obviously. And uh, I mean, you could bounce around for like the past, 2,000 years or whatever, or 1,000 years, so there, there's so much, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm, like, like the past seven, six or seven years, you know, you know even in pop world or, or hip hop, Kendrick Lamar and stuff, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, I like a lot, <laughs> um, <laughs> the Beatles albums, everything, so everything's really influenced me, and as far as teachers, all, all, all my teachers at Yale, and especially the, you know, the, um, and, but, but what's really important is when I first started composing, Julia Wolf was my teacher, and I think I got really lucky to have her as my first composition, uh, official composition teacher, because she really um, let me be me, and, and uh, brought out, not trying to conform me to something, like, like really letting me, one, be who they are, and bringing the best out of them from that. And she really had that. And very inspiring, because I love music and all that. And, and then I, I did Bang and Cam, and learned about that, and so I really got into them. And that's, that was my gateway into classical music, really, was uh, contemporary classical and Bang and Cam. So you know, I'd, heard, I'd heard more Ligeti and Bartok and everything. Even, I know that's a little bit older, or David Lang and stuff. And, before I'd heard more Schubert, you know, I knew who Schubert was, I didn't really know who he was, you know, and then I started listening to that more. And then, and then so, and also going back to school at a way later age, you know, I, I think I started again, I was 28 years old when I started getting into all this. So then, you know, I got to stay with Julian and, and I, you know, I saw people like Niels Wiegland at MSM and then I got a chance to go to Yale and, Study with David Lane, Christia Fanitas, who was super inspiring to me, David Latterman, Martin Bresnik, you know, got to, got to interact with Ingram Marshall and Aaron Curtis too, even though I didn't study directly from them. You know, a lot, a lot, I'm, I know I'm leaving a bunch of people out. And then, and then I, and then have an opportunity to study at Princeton and Steve Mackey was a huge influence and Paul Lansky, amazing. Like I, I just learned so much, you know, Dimitri Tomasco, <laughs> Dan Truman, you know. <laughs> It's, it's just like a, it's a cool crew. Um, and, and then, so I never studied with one person more than, Julie was the, one, the most I've studied with, because I studied with her for about a year. Most, most other, everybody else is about a semester with, or at, at Princeton it was more like you email and you know, lesson and stuff like that, you know? Um, um, yeah, I mean, it's been so many influences. And then I was in Princeton too, because Donna could then he got there as I was starting to leave too. Um, but then I also learned a lot when I first moved to New York with a jazz guitarist um, in the Calypso world, like Scipio Sargent, the Calypsonian. He taught me a lot about pain. He didn't play pain, 
but he he played guitar well and he would teach me lines on that. And then I, I mentioned earlier Freddie Harris and that crew, um, Cream Thompson, all those guys. Um, and then, you know, people like Ian, all, all, all my close colleagues, like Ian, Sean Dixon, all, Kenneth, all, all these, uh, Bajinder we talked about earlier, these are all huge influences. Bajinder was a big influence because he really, he always believed in me, you know, we're like the same age, but he was doing composition first and stuff, and he, he always believed in me to, to kind of pursue that too, you know. That's a lot, but there's a lot of influences. So I, if you ask me, I said earlier, if you ask me one particular beat of one measure of one composition or song I've written, I could probably tell you exactly, I could pinpoint, and then it'd be a much narrower answer <laughs> to the question. <laughs> you just to ask everything, I mean, you might as well say Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, just as much, or Frank Gehry, anything, you know what I'm saying? The point is, is that it's, it's so many influences. And, and, and almost every single beat has some kind of different thread to one of them, you know? So. Definitely. And that's why, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I heard you talking again on another podcast and you said that your music is more you than, than you talking. Um, and in many ways, this is all heard in, in music in a beat of time. You know, we can hear so much of eclecticism of yours. Um, which I think is really wonderful because you're welcoming to all these different influences. You're like, uh, I don't know, you're like a port for, for all different cultures and, and all different kinds of music and, and arts. And that's, that's at least how I experience your music and your personality, which makes it so joyful. Carly, um, you have something to tell us about an important well, event. We all just recently heard the very sad news that John Pratt passed away on April 6, 2020, just a few days ago at the age of 89. Um, John Pratt, of course, is very well known in the percussion world as the author of the popular 14 Modern Contest solos, along with uh, the 2000 release Rudimental Solos for Accomplished Drummers, the new Pratt book that was published in 1985, and a couple of lesser-known books. Um, they're called Ancient Rudimental Snare and Bass Drum Solos and 128 Rudimental Street Beats, and both of these were actually written to be a part of a larger book along with 14 Modern Contest Solos, and they were, they were published back in 1959, too. Um, so John Pratt was born on January 13th in 1931 in Seneca Falls, New York. He got to start drumming at the age of 10. He played in his school's marching and concert bands. He played in their high school orchestra. And also during high school, he met Norman Peth, who ended up being a hugely inspirational teacher for him. Um, he instructed the local drum and bugle corps, that's Norman Peth, um, and became, you know, later his colleague and his friend and was actually the inspiration of my friend Norman that we probably all know, so that's that's pretty cool. Um, Pratt ended up playing alongside Norman Peth in the Geneva Apple Knockers, another drum and bugle corps, while he was still in high school. And then when he graduated high school, he joined the Army um, and ended up auditioning for and being accepted to the Hellcats Drum and Bugle Corps at West Point. Um, he stayed there for his 20-year military career. Um, and about halfway through that career, he was appointed to the position of rudimental drum instructor and arranger for the Hellcats. Um, and before he retired from the Army in 1969, after those 20 years, he was working on earning his associate's degree and then later his bachelor's degree in English. And so when he retired from the Army, he taught high school English for 25 years at Hackensack High School in New Jersey. Um, which actually I never knew about John Pratt. Some of you might have known that. Um, so in addition to being this legendary drummer and composer that we all know and love, Pratt, Pratt was also published as a, po as a poet. He wrote a master's thesis on the poetry of John Keats. He was the president of the Chaucer Guild, which was a poetry society in New Jersey. Um, but through all these years that he was an English teacher and poet by day, he was still playing. Later in his life, he joined the ex-Fifth Regiment, a drum and bugle corps in Patterson, New Jersey. And he was featured as a performer at PASIC in 2001 and again in 2002. So I don't know if any of you were at those PASICs. I know I wasn't. Um, but that was so cool. I wish I could have could have heard him. And I he think, kept writing. Sorry, I, I, think there is, I think there's a DVD of that performance. Is that the, the drummer's heritage concert? Yeah. 
Yeah, I was at that. Yeah, North Texas. Cool. At that too. Yeah. So yeah, I, that's I, so cool. I own that DVD. I don't, I don't know that I've ever actually watched it, and I don't you know. Sure, it's not a laser disc. Yeah, I don't know if I even. <laughs> watch it now, but, sorry. Go it's ahead. only 2002. It's not that long ago. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're right. My bad. <laughs> So he kept writing all those years too, and he just has so many, so many rudimental snare solos. Um, so while I was reading up on Pratt, I actually came across a few stories that I had never heard before that brought a smile to my face. Um, one of which was written about in a 2002 Percussive Notes article by Lauren Vogel Weiss, um, and John Pratt is remembering meeting Leopold Stokowski at the conductor's 90th birthday party, which was at West Point. So they played for him. And afterwards, Stokowski was requesting to meet, like, who wrote who wrote this music, who wrote this drumming? Um, and so he was summoned to go and, and speak with him. And this is what Stokowski said to Pratt. He said, I was told that you were the gentleman who wrote the drum parts. I would like to congratulate you. It was an experience to watch and to listen to. And he said they, they just talked shop for about 30 minutes. Um, and he said Stokowski knows more about drumming than any other conductor he had ever met. Um, so I thought that was a nice anecdote. Um, here's another one, a, a kind of memory. Dennis De Lucia, who played with Pratt and the Hellcats um, for three years in the 1960s, said of Pratt that he was one of the most intellectually brilliant men I've ever met and was a player that none of us could touch. Um, on a sillier note, legend has it that John Pratt was known during his West Point days to sometimes stand on the roof of his house and water his grass from there. And when people would ask him why he did that, he said it was so that the grass would think it was raining. So <laughs> that was just like one of those old stories they would tell about him. It's very Michael Colgrass. Kind of. Right. I, I <laughs> I that that. That, yeah. Oh God, I wish I could do that quirky. <laughs> <laughs> Someday, <laughs> you have time. Um, on a on a more personal note, I know probably the same for many of you or all of you. Uh, John Pratt snare drum solos have been a regular part of my snare drum routine since I was first introduced to them back when I was in high school. Um, and it, of course, in addition to their musical value, like they're just so fun to play. They feel so good. Um, and they've helped us all develop the musical and technical skills we need um, to play rudimental snare drum, um, you know, all types of snare drumming, and also that we apply to so many other areas of percussion. Um, later in his life, Pratt said in an interview, um, if there's anything my books have done, they may have drawn together the two very distant poles of drumming. The, the strict rudimental drumming of the Connecticut Fife and Drum Corps, or Drum and Bugle Corps in general, and the concert players, both orchestral and symphonic. So if there's anything to be celebrated during this very strange time of social distancing and quarantine, I think that drawing people together through drumming is definitely one of them. So thank you, John Pratt. You will be greatly missed, and your influence on the percussion community has been enormous. Your music will be played and enjoyed, I'm sure, for generations to come. Just for a final question, I sort of wanted to start this Proust questionnaire type of thing. Um, so I'm just going to ask you something which can be a short answer if you wanted to. Um, and that is, uh, which talent would you like to have? Talent. Talent, yeah. Like, if, if, I, if I was all of a sudden given, like, the power to be pro at anything or something, you know? Yeah. Is that yeah. what you mean? Mm -hmm. Like, be like baller at whatever. Yeah, I would, I'd actually, yeah, maybe, maybe first thing that came to mind. <laughs> It'd be cool if I was twice as tall and could. Sorry, say that one more time. Your, your mic cut out for just a second. What was that? Yeah, it'd be, I don't know, maybe basketball. That's the first thing that pops in my mind just now. But if you have me five minutes from now, that might be the last thing that pops in my mind. I, I, love, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I don't know. That's what cool. would you be? That's what cool. would you do? Um, if I yeah. could have one talent, I would really like to be able to paint. Well, that'd be my talent. Ben, yours? Uh, I, I don't know. Can you be put on the spot like that? Right <laughs> off the top of my head, I would say cooking. You're already good at that. Stop it. Yeah. I'm not like a pro though. Okay. 
Let's say that you're not a pro. If you follow his like Facebook, he's definitely a pro. But <laughs> <laughs> cool. Andy, thank you so, so, so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure and for sharing all your uh, thoughts and feelings with us here. And Andy, we have an award to give you. You win the award for most co-hosts on a single podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the rotating crew today. Like, oh yeah, sorry. I think that's because of my lateness and everything. <laughs> I, I appreciate everything. Uh, no, I, everybody I, wanted to hang out with you. That's why. Don't worry about it. Our well, plan. I, I, we got to hang. It, it was it was a lot of fun. Anytime, y'all. Yeah, let's, let's kick it. <laughs> and then you know, when coronavirus is over. We gotta we gotta chill in real life too. I like <laughs> the digital way of communicating I, I like to be next to somebody you know but uh yes. thank you so much it's been a pleasure yes and we totally understand we agree thank you so much have a lovely and productive and restful rest of your corona break um and we'll see you guys on our next episode 229 yeah. bye. thank you bye see you